Hey guys, Alec Pierce from Vintage Scuba. Here we are again, and before I begin, I want to say, Hi, Simply Scuba! <laughs> uh, Simply Scuba is a, uh, it's actually a fantastic uh, 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 YouTube and website to visit. Simply Scuba is a very, very big online store located in Kent. Kent in the UK, in England, yeah, England. Interesting enough, Simply Scuba, if you're listening, my grandfather and father were born in Kent, and I've been to Kent numerous times, and I will not make the mistake next time we're back in Kent of dropping in. I, I will not make it. I'll, I'll come and see you. Anyway, thanks very much uh, calling me a heavy hitter. That's pretty funny. <laughs> but um, so now a lot of you guys have been asking about some of my treasures. 60, over 60 years I've been scuba diving. And you would think that in 60 years I would have picked up the odd spoon or maybe a gold doubloon or something like that. I picked up the odd thing. No gold doubloons, unfortunately. Not that it doesn't look. No gold doubloons, but a couple of other pretty interesting things over the years from my time in the Caribbean. I worked in, in Florida for a while and all over the world. Uh, but, you know, the sport has changed a great deal. And the days when a scuba diver went out searching for treasure are almost gone. It still happens occasionally, but those days are almost gone. Most divers today uh, are uh, modern divers. How is that for a, a complimentary term? Which means that they don't disturb the shipwrecks. They don't touch the things in the shipwrecks. And I think it's wonderful because uh, there's no question about it in the 60s and well into the 70s when uh, the object of scuba diving was in fact to find things and retrieve them and bring them home and put them into your basement while they rusted and dusted and finally got sold at a flea market or thrown out. Those days are gone. And I think it's good. Uh, there are so many divers today that it simply couldn't continue. But Back in those days, uh, I was part of that group, of course. I started diving in 58. So 60, 70, 15, 20 years later, I was actively involved in the sport of scuba diving. And that meant that I was actively involved in the looking for shipwrecks and looking for neat artifacts. And I have a few. This one right here. Some of you guys that dive in Ontario may recognize this. No, you won't recognize it. But let me tell you about this. This obviously is a dead eye, a well-worn dead eye. You can tell it's a well-worn dead eye because if you look at this eye, and you can, do I need to tell, why, tell you why it looks like a dead eye? The mouth and the eyes from a dead man? That's what it looks like. But anyway, that's what it's called. You can see from here, this is wood. The center part is wood. And you can see the grooves in here for the lines that hold the rigging. And these dead eyes, if you look at a, I can't explain it very well, but if you look at any model or picture of a sailing wreck and zoom in on the, on the shear line, on the gunnel, you see lots of dead eyes. They hold the, the lines that support the mass and so on. So the lines went in there and the ropes came around, the lines came around and went into those grooves. But this one you can see on this side, which is the active side, would be the uh, outside uh, on the ship. Those lines and grooves are not quite as as uh, as uh, neat as the other side. This is the working side that got hit occasionally, and the lines didn't all, all fall in the right place. So anyway, it's a hunk of wood, and I don't know what this is. It's a very very black. It could be ironwood. I'm not too sure exactly what it is. And then that hunk of wood is surrounded by steel. Often a steel strap went around them. In this case, it's uh, two iron rods that wrapped around like a like two fingers and then held together by a bolt and this was fastened to the ship's side often it's held like this 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 bar here had a steel strap that went down the ship's side and was bolted in through the hull of the ship so it was very very strong and then the lines were run through this and they could run these lines through this and hold up a, a 60 70 80 90 foot mast and those masts were, were giant uh, uh, trees, white oak, cedar, pine, whatever, giant trees. So these would be very, very strong. And the lines would pull very tightly so that mast would stand rigidly. Then they would put the sails on and all the other running lines, rigging, if you like. So this is, uh, this is a dead eye. Uh, and it's a, pr a pretty neat artifact. And this particular dead eye <clears throat> is from a ship in Ontario, Canada. Yeah, this dead eye is from the uh, George, I think it's the George... A marsh, you probably call it the marsh. If you've dived on the wrecks in Kingston, Ontario, and Kingston uh, is on the east side of Ontario, and uh, in the St. Lawrence River, it's on the St. Lawrence River. Uh, Kingston is a famous fort town. There's been a fort in Kingston since the 1700s. And uh, this, this particular uh, uh, ship, the marsh, is not that old. 
the marsh sank in about 1917, I believe. It had been around for quite a while, but it was a three-masted schooner, and uh, this was taken from that. Now, before any of you start criticizing me, you fellow some Save Our Shipwrecks, Save Ontario Shipwrecks, I think it is, wonderful guys, and they do a great job of uh, recording and saving the shipwrecks. Don't give me a hard time, okay? This was taken from the marsh in the late 60s, early 70s, maybe 70, 71. I forget exactly what year it was. I was diving with another uh, well-known dive store operator owner here in Ontario. I won't bother mentioning his name, but the two of us were out diving at that time. And we decided that this, this was laying loose anyway. It would have disappeared anyway. But it's been on display many, many times in several of my dive stores. A lot of people have enjoyed looking at it. I used to have a sign on it in my dive stores. So this is not one of those typical artifacts that was uh, hidden away, rusted, and disappeared. A lot of divers have enjoyed it. But it was taken back then. And I'm not going to... I'm not going to throw it back in the St. Lawrence River. So anyway, there you go. So that's an artifact uh, that's uh, pretty neat. Now, I have one more to show you and another neat story. Uh, uh, th this, this, is a, this is, I think you all know this. This is a porthole. Uh, this is a porthole uh, from a, a much more modern. I should tell you about this, by the way. The marsh, it did, I'm just thinking now, it did sink in 1917. And it was a bit of a tragedy. It was, the ship was carrying coal at the time. And if you ever get a chance to dive the marsh in Kingston, strong currents. Very strong currents there. If you get a chance to dive the marsh and you get down and you dig, it's quite an intact wreck. At least it was last time I dove it, which is 35, 40 years ago. <laughs> anyway, uh, more than that. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you get in and you get down to the very bottom and dig around in the bottom, you might come up with these lumps of uh, rock. Yeah, it looks like rock, black, gooky stuff down in there. Coal. It was carrying a load of coal. Yeah, coal was at that time was a very well-known fuel used in steamships were becoming popular in the seven, 1917 and the early 1900s. And anyway, the marsh uh, sank. The tragedy is that um, there were 17 people on board, 15 people, and 12 of them died, including the ship's wife and his new baby. It was not his first wife. He had five children on board from previous wives. I'm not sure how many extra, but he had six children on board, five from previous wives, and his new wife and her new and their new baby. They all died. So a bit of a personal touch there as well to that ship, the marsh. This is, uh, I have a personal story about this as well. Now this porthole did not come from uh, Ontario. So relax. This porthole, in fact, came from a long way from Ontario. This porthole came from Barbados. That's right. Again, back in the 70s and 80s, maybe, uh, 80s, I drove quite a bit on Barbados. And I had a very, very good friend down there who was still alive. He's older than me and has been a diver there in Barbados for 50 or 60 years as well. And uh, still runs a dive boat down there, the Scotch and Soda. His name is Ram. And uh, Ram and I did a lot of diving together, a lot of spearfishing at that time. Another part of the sport of scuba diving has changed a great deal. But anyway, a lot of spear fishing. It was excellent. And uh, so there were several nice wrecks in Barbados. And one of the most popular wrecks at the time, anyway, although I think it's uh, pretty much disintegrated now, I understand, was the Friars Craig. Friar, like a Friar Tuck and Craig, C R A I G. I think it's Friars Craig was a, um, a modern ship, a relatively modern ship. And, uh, and, and it had uh, portholes like this on it, and it sank as well. It was a fishing vessel, a large fishing vessel, and it had portal. Now this weighs, how much does this weigh, Kevin? 10 pounds, 12 pounds? Yeah, more than that, 15 pounds maybe? This is not all of it. When these were put in a steel ship, there was a, a, a brass frame that was sealed and then riveted right to the hull of the ship. And then this porthole went into a hinge pin on the side, and it, it, it would swing in like this. So this is the in, you're in the ship looking out, and this would you know, undo a latch, unscrew a latch, and swing it in. Then you look up, smell the sea air, and slam it quick. Uh, anyway, that's how these portholes worked. So, but this is the only part we could get off uh, easily, and that wasn't that easy. I remember the, getting this uh, at the time, and both Ram and I, both young, very experienced divers and uh, healthy and strong at the time. We struggled with this. I seem to recall we ran out of air at the very end and uh, and uh, came, came to the, and it's a long story. 
But anyway, we took this off the Friars Craig. Now, so that's part of the story. I've had this a very long time, ever since that time, in the mid 70s, no, early 80s. I've had this all that time. And again, it's been on display with a little bit of history about it on my, uh, in my dive store. It's the glass plate in here, if you're able to see the inside, is probably three quarters of an inch thick, the glass plate. That's what gives it the weight. The brass is not light, but the glass plate. So this is a genuine solid brass porthole. You can see the rubber seal around there. I don't know if you can see that, Kevin, the rubber seal around there. But anyway, and, and what, I, uh, what I did to make this kind of interesting is when I, when I got it back, it was quite a mess because it had been in the ocean in Barbados, in the Caribbean for many, many years. So it was entirely covered with uh, incrustation. So it's, it's a big word that means marine junk. Incrustation. You see here how the brass is all covered with little sea creatures and, and the crusted up and so on, and the glass itself. And all dirty. So what I did for fun is, is I cleaned exactly one half of it. So I scrubbed the glass clean and I polished the brass on this side. And just in preparation for this video, I polished it. You can see, can you see that shine in there? Down here by the hinge, you see some of that shine. It's beautiful, beautiful solid brass. If I had taken the time and it was so inclined, and I got cleaned this thoroughly and cleaned up all the brass, it would be just beautiful. They actually are, they actually do come apart. Uh, yeah, it looks like it unscrews, but not going to happen with me anyway. So there you go. I, I, oh, I know I was going to tell you the story. So th this was on display in one of my dive stores, specifically Scuba 2000, up until just four or five years ago. And uh, with a little sign on it. Uh, from uh, the Friars Craig shipwreck in Barbados, okay? So I'm standing there one day, one afternoon, and this very nice uh, young man comes in, uh, tall, uh, uh, dark-skinned, obviously from the Caribbean or somewhere like that, and we got chatting. He was an instructor, a scuba instructor, and we chatted a little bit, and turns out he was from Barbados. Oh, I said, one of my favorite islands, which is quite true. Beautiful island, wonderful people, good food, diving, everything, diving's good, and everything else, and, and uh, so we got chatting, and I said, hey, take a look over here, here's a porthole from a shipwreck in Barbados, and he comes over and he looks down, the Friars Craig, the Fri that's my uncle's boat, that's my uncle's boat, my dad told me about uh, this boat, the Friars Craig that belonged to his brother, and it's a big, and it sank, and Wow! <laughs> so he was really excited, and I actually went into the case and pulled it out and, and let him hold this and take a picture and another picture of me beside us so he could send a picture to his uncle or his dad, at least in Barbados, to tell them that he'd come all the way to uh, Toronto, Ontario, and found a porthole from his uncle's fishing boat in Barbados. Ah, that was kind of neat. Again, it makes it a little bit personal, huh? That's why he keeps some of these things, because there's often a personal story involved. So there you go, guys. A couple of treasures from my many years of scuba diving, and I've got lots more. As we go along, I'll see if I can find some more and uh, tell you a bit more about diving in the old days, in the Stone Age, as Kevin says. Vintage diving. Alec Pierce, bye-bye, Simply Scuba. Thanks very much. Heavy hitter. I love it. Bye-bye. <laughs>